Good morning and welcome to this 11th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can I make the usual request that mobile devices are switched on to elec um, electronic mode, I was going to say, airplane mode, and off the tables, please. Um, we should have David Torrance with us here this morning. Um, uh, hopefully he'll be here in a few, few minutes. And Jamie Green is running a wee bit late and should be here with us this morning. Our um, committee advisor, Murray Hunt, who is not with us in the room, but is listening online um, to, to keep us um, keep abreast of the proceedings this morning. The first agenda item is a continuation of our Human Rights in the Scottish Parliament inquiry. Um, our first panel this morning, we have two panels this morning, a small but beautiful panel and then a much larger panel later who will probably just be equally as beautiful. Um, but in our first panel this morning we have Nick Hobbs who is the Head of Advice and Investigations at the Children's and Young People's Commissioner's Office, uh, Nora Urig, is that the correct pronunciation, excellent, uh, is a Senior Associate at Programmes Scotland Equalities and Human Rights Commission and Judith Robison who is the Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. We will be joined by Marie Anderson who is the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman but again just running a wee bit late, it seems that Edinburgh traffic is against everyone this morning. Uh, we're really grateful for you to come along to committee this morning. Um, I know that you've all been keen to take part in this inquiry and um, we're keen to hear from you too. Um, can we say a grateful thanks for the written evidence that we've had so far, uh, but we're really keen to interrogate some of those avenues this morning. Now, we've got a tight time scale this morning. We've got about 55 minutes with you and then a second panel, as I said, and, and then some other work of the committee to do. So I'm going to go straight into questions, but it's a general opening question, so it'll give you a chance to say a wee bit about yourself, your organisation and the reasons why uh, this inquiry is important. And I'm going to start with Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, when I go around my constituency and I speak to my constituents and I ask them, what does human rights mean to you? A lot of them think that human rights is something that happens to other people. So the starter question is, how do we embed human rights in society? And particularly um, in the submissions, I noticed that there were quite a few recommendations as to how we start, especially in the younger years, children and, and school age years. How do, we, how do we get the message out there that human rights is for everyone? Shall I start? <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you for the question. Um, this is the work of the inquiry, to be honest. Uh, for this specific context, we're looking at the role of the parliament in, in exactly that process. And I think the, the many of the questions of the uh, uh, inquiry address exactly that point. So that, for me, the question in this context is one of leadership. The leadership coming from the parliament and the government in Scotland, expressing uh, the language of human rights, using the language of human rights, supporting people to understand that human rights are universal. We all have all the rights. Um, they are not something for a, any particular group of individual. And that when it comes to having conversations about human rights, the more we, we as leaders within our societies um, can bring the express understanding of the human rights framework, what it brings, what it means for people, um, the more we will be able to enable our citizens, our, our constituents, the population at large, to understand that exactly that, that human rights are universal. So we've made some specific suggestions um, in relation to the leadership that this committee can provide. Um, this is the Parliament's role in that is really significant. Um, it, it already plays a role. Um, and part of this process to, is, is to really strengthen that role. So internationally, the recognition of parliaments um, and the role of parliaments in bringing that uh, issue to people's attention has been increasingly recognised. Council of Europe, United Nations, um, all are, the Commonwealth are all saying that the parliaments have a, a lot of work to do in that regard and, and can play that role. So both whether it be scrutiny of legislation, whether it be um, looking, bringing into play the treaty body processes um, from the UN, into much more into our public narrative and consciousness, um, and the, uh, supporting civil society organisations to do that, and, and for example, scrutiny of the budget from a human rights perspective. All these processes that are intrinsic to the Parliament's day-to-day -day running have the potential to incorporate human rights into their into their thinking and into their analysis. So 
there isn't a single answer to your question. Um, from, from the perspective of this inquiry, there are a range of initiatives that the Parliament and, the, um, and this committee, for example, could undertake. And I'm assuming that in the course of the evidence, we can unpack a few more of them in detail. Um, one of the key objectives in um, the Commissioner's revised strategic plan, uh, which we laid before Parliament in March with the help of our um, amazing young advisers, and I, I believe Gail Ross was there, um, is to create a culture of uh, children's human rights in Scotland. So we very much welcome the committee's inquiry um, and the recognition that I think um, all of us on this panel and around the table share um, of the, uh, the important role that the Scottish Parliament can play as a human rights guarantor. And I think in working towards that goal, uh, it's important to recognise, as the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child does, uh, that children don't have the same economic or political power uh, as adults. Um, and that means the Parliament has to pay particular attention uh, to their rights and to ensure that they're fully and meaningfully uh, involved in decision-making on all matters affecting them. And the UN Committee makes very, very clear that when we're considering all matters affecting the child, we have to understand that in its broadest sense. Um, and that means all of the Parliament's committees um, are going to be considering issues that engage children's human rights. Um, so while I believe there's, there's a real opportunity, um, and I, I agree with a great deal of what, um, of what Judith said, there's a real opportunity for this committee to become a centre of excellence, if you like, for, for human rights in the Scottish Parliament. Um, we have to ensure that we improve um, the scope for children's participation, um, the processes across the Parliament. Uh, across the whole range of the Parliament's activities um, and across all of its committees, and to do that in line with uh, international standards and best practice to ensure that we mainstream children's rights considerations throughout all aspects of the Parliament's work, um, including legislative scrutiny and accountability. Um, in terms of the, the kind of question about how to make um, human rights meaningful, uh, I think it's important to recognise that children and young people are living with human rights issues and the impacts of human rights issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that came across really strongly in the consultation that we conducted um, around our strategic plan. It comes across really strongly in, in every um, engagement and discussion that we have with children and young people, um, whether we're talking about um, rights to education, um, poverty, mental health. These are things that, that really impact on children's lives um, daily. What's missing, I think, sometimes is an understanding for them about um, where the decisions that affect those issues are made, um, how they're made, um, how to change them, and perhaps most importantly, the fact that, um, that those decisions can be changed and challenged. Um, so there's a really important role, I think, for the Parliament there in terms of, um, in terms of education, um, in terms of, of outreach, um, working directly with children and young people. Um, and making the, the, the processes um, through which those decisions are made um, and through which um, human rights issues are, are, are kind of given life um, for people's day-to-day -day existence, um, making that really accessible for children and young people. Good. Nora? Yeah. <coughs> um, I would support what both Judith and Nick have said. I think it's vital that you use the language of human rights yourselves, that you get others to use it, so other committees and um, that you really collaborate. And I think when you take an overall approach to human rights um, and you specifically try to include people with lived experience, um, organizations that work closely with people with lived experience, and um, for example, especially focus on marginalized groups. So with that, I think equalities plays a huge um, importance. You could, um, of course, look at the nine protected characteristics set out in the Equality Act 2010, but also go beyond that, um, groups that maybe aren't included, such as asylum seekers, and I know uh, the committee's done some work on that. And again, I think what Nick has said, and both, actually Judith as well, plays into that. So, um, you know, talk to these people, include them, ensure that when any activity you do, it doesn't even have to um, be something connected to this committee, but you as an MSP use the language uh, of human rights and include sort of an analysis of human rights and equalities throughout your work. And then I think once you do that and you have established a process and get, I don't know, education on human rights um, to reach more people across Scotland, then hopefully that will sort of spread out into 
society as a whole. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marie, welcome to the committee. We're glad you could make yeah, it to your... I'm going to let Gail Ross come back in with her questions just so that you're, uh, you're understanding where, where she's coming from. Good morning, Marie. Um, I was just initially asking the panel, um, when I go and ask my constituents what human rights mean, they say that human rights means something for someone else. So how do we embed human rights in society and how do we have an understanding that human rights, as Judith said, is universal, is for everyone? And especially for, for school children, I think that, um, Nick, and I, I just want to pick up that point about the group with the young <coughs> advisors I did attend, and I want to put on my record my thanks for, for their attendance and all the work that they've done. They were absolutely fantastic. Um, so how do, how do we embed human rights in society? Good morning, convener, deputy convener and members of the committee. My apologies for being late. Um, their passengers didn't board the plane and that's why I'm late this morning. But I, I'm going to suggest to the committee uh, what is not a novel approach, but an innovative approach to embedding human rights. And I think that's possibly why I was invited to speak here this morning. Um, and it's called, it, it, we have in Northern Ireland, in my office in Northern Ireland, a human rights based approach, which is to investigations and to our work, which embeds human rights principles and values in the work of the Ombudsman. What do I do? I investigate complaints of maladministration about all public services in Northern Ireland, health and social care, and I have an extended remit in relation to education, so children and young people and their rights are very much at the forefront of my mind. Traditionally, the UK model of Ombudsman has not included a human rights mandate. I don't have an explicit human rights mandate. Nevertheless, I have developed with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission a human rights based approach to my work, which is investigation. And what is a human rights based approach? It's taking the principles of participation, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment and accountability, and it's, it's making it real. What I'd say I, we do in investigating complaints about public services is applied human rights. In real terms, what does that mean? It means more than simply using human rights language when I report on a prisoner who's complaining about his lack of privacy because he's had bowel cancer and has a colostomy bag and has to shower with other prisoners. It's much more than the language of human rights. It's actually I am testing public authorities in Northern Ireland and asking them, have you ha had regard to the human rights of the people who are complaining to me and this individual in a particular case? Now, why is that relevant to the work of the Parliament and in particular committees? All committees, uh, I, I presume in, in Scottish parliaments, might, like the Northern Ireland Assembly, have, have a number of roles uh, in terms of making legislation, but also scrutiny. In scrutinising and in, a, and, and in your inquiries mode, you can adopt a human rights-based approach. You can ensure that, 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 that there is participation in terms of sufficient information is given when, you, when you're uh, uh, consulting on an issue, that sufficient information is given and that it's understandable. Take the example of children and young pe persons. I'm pretty sure that my 17 year old can tell me when he's been treated unfairly. Does he know about the Human Rights Act? No. But, you know, fundamentally, fairness and human rights, they, you know, they have a sense of it. Children, young people, they have a sense of it. But education is key. And if you don't educate school children, if they're not programmes in schools, uh, primary and secondary, about what the Human Rights Act is, in plain and simple terms, they'll never be able to participate in decision-making or consultations because they won't understand it. So that's just one element of it. So I suppose I would urge the committee to think about a human rights-based approach, which is not focusing on jurisprudence of the European Court, but is taking the principles of participation, non-discrimination, empowering. How can you empower a young person to exercise their rights if they don't know about the rights that they have? So information, empowerment, and accountability. You see, fundamentally, my job is to hold public service providers to account. And in doing that, I ask them, 
where are your human rights policies and procedures, and how in this particular case, in relation to a young person, a 16-year-old, who wanted to go to college, but her, her, her parents didn't want her to go to college, how have you addressed this issue? How have you allowed that young person to participate in the decision about her education and her future? And I ask those questions, and in asking, and in your scrutiny role, with a human rights-based approach, you can embed human rights. Super. Super. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you all for your answers. I guess that if we're going to be embedding human rights in the curriculum, I mean, the young advisors are extremely switched on, um, but they're teenagers. How young do you start, and how do you make it simplified for children that are in you know, primary school age? How do you introduce it? And I think UNICEF have, a, um, as members will be aware, a very good um, rights respecting schools programme. Um, and that, that often involves introducing rights issues to children who are um, at kind of primary age. So um, I think, as, as St Marie said, children understand issues of, of kind of fairness um, and equality on, on quite an instinctive level sometimes. So I don't think these, are, these aren't alien concepts that we're introducing. Um, and really it's about the, the language that we use um, and the examples that we choose um, when we try to explain what these things are. So, I mean, one, one example might be that, um, as you'd expect, one of the things that, that our office spends a lot of time thinking about is how we, we communicate um, things like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child um, to children and young people. And one of the things that we often talk about is we frame the idea of rights, um, of rights that are, that are contained within these international instruments as a, a series of promises that are made um, by the government um, when they sign up to these conventions. Um, and we talk about the commissioner's role as being making sure that those promises are kept, those promises to children and young people are kept by the government. Um, and I think you could, you could frame the kind of the accountability role of, of the parliament in a, in a similar sort of way. Um, to hold government to account for those promises that are made at an international level um, to children and young people. And I think that's, that's something that's, um, that children understand um, quite readily, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mary Fee. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning, um, panel. And my question follows on quite, um, quite nicely from the question and the discussion that we've, we've just had. And, and it, it centres on, on children. Without full incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, can we actually ensure full protection for children? I answer that. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't believe you can. I believe that you need to, to not only have regard to the European Convention, but the international treaties. Can I explain a case that I investigated in the office? It was a case of a 17-year-old a who had a history of alcohol and drug abuse. And he was just short of his 18th birthday when he was admitted to hospital following a suicide attempt. He wasn't living at home, but his parents, his parents wanted to be involved in his care and the decision to discharge him from uh, an A&E um, which was, you know, an A&E unit where he had been admitted because of, of his suicide attempt. Now, in that case, I couldn't address the balance of rights here without actually looking at the, um, the, the International Convention on the Rights of the Child and the report from the committee and the advice from the committee, because there's a balance of rights here. There was the parents' rights to have an involvement in the decision to discharge him when they feared that he would either abuse drugs or, again, have another suicide attempt. So there were those parental rights, but there were also his rights as a 17-year-old, and the, the issue of Gaelic competency obviously was relevant. But the, the hospital trust were adamant that, that the young person's rights took precedence in those circumstances. They discharged him. Sadly, three days later, he committed suicide and died. Suicide and died. And the parents have found it very, very difficult, obviously, to deal with that. But when I was dealing with that investigation and deciding whose rights take precedence, it wasn't to the European Convention of Human Rights, it was to the International Convention on the Rights of the Child and the committee's advice on that, that I had to go to find that the voice of the young person is important and, and sometimes is supreme. And I made the decision 
that there was no maladministration in the trust discharge in that case. Nick? Um, the will be wholly unsurprised, I think, um, to hear me say that I think uh, incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is, is long overdue. Um, we're very pleased that the, the government's committed to, to give it some further thoughts um, and to look at options, but I think that's, that's really something that we need to make, um, we need to make progress with. Um, and in particular, I think there's, there's something really important there about, um, about redress um, and about remedy um, and about making the convention and those rights justiciable um, so that um, children and young people um, could go to court um, if they needed to do so. Um, there is something as well, I think, around um, culture and practice. Um, so legislation on its own um, isn't, um, isn't a solution. Um, it's not a silver bullet. Um, it's important um, and it, it's really critical that we get the, the CRC um, incorporated into domestic legislation, but there will still be a great deal of work to follow on from that around really embedding um, a rights respecting culture and a culture that respects human rights and practice. Um, so that's, that's absolutely critical as well, I think. Yeah, because, I mean, my, my personal view, and it won't surprise anyone on, on, on this committee, that, that we need to fully incorporate. And I think to look at options, we can't take half measures. We can't cherry pick what we do. and We either fully incorporate or would as well, I think, doing, doing nothing because we're not going to help anyone by, by going so far and, and doing nothing else. It, it can't be a sliding scale of, we'll do this now and then in five years we'll think about doing something else. And I, I don't know if that's something that you would agree with. As I said, you will, you will get mm. no disagreement from me in terms of the importance of incorporating the CRC as, as quickly as possible. Judith or Nora, I don't know if you no, have it's any not like, I completely agree. And ultimately, the gold standard of any um, international treaty process where all the recommendations um, absolutely uh, look for full incorporation for all the reasons that have been described around accountability, around the mechanisms of redress, around ensuring that across public authorities and state and government, the state is, is, is held to account in relation to the standards of the treaty. Um, which they have signed up to. I, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the point, is that we have already agreed to this process. Um, and because of our, our system of, of, of lawmaking and governance in the UK, we have to incorporate for that to actually be implemented into our law. So, so um, that's absolutely right. However, I, my only caveat is that I wouldn't say no progress can be made um, uh, and and without full incorporation. I would never step back from full incorporation, but I also recognise that steps can be made on the way. And I wouldn't say don't take those steps. I wouldn't say do nothing or do the full thing. I would always say take the steps. If the full thing, and, and we would always advocate for full incorporation. Um, but in absolute recognition of, of how Nick has described it, if the law, um, the law is not, the, is not the, the law is a framework and a means of accountability. It's very important. But there, without effective implementation, right through the, the analysis and the mindset and the, the ways of working of public authorities in Scotland, um, it, it's not that the law becomes meaningless. The law is not clearly not meaningless. But it, that's where um, the real impact on people's lives lies. It's, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, in small places close to home. It's in those rooms where decisions are made, individual decisions are made about people, where you, where you see people's rights either realised or not realised. So those, those decisions about are you, are you as a Roma child in our cult culture today going to be able to access education or a doctor or a, a decent house? These are rights decisions um, and, and applies ac across our society, not just for children. Children are amongst the most vulnerable, potentially. But we have very, very many vulnerable citizens um, for whom the whole of the rights framework, incorporation of economic, social, cultural rights, as well as the civil and political rights that we have, is, is a really important step. I know our uh, colleagues have follow-on questions on this, but, but, but surely incorporation helps us in our scrutiny role? Yes, absolutely. No, I, I mean, please don't think I'm... I'm, I'm no. it's, it's a really important... It is the gold standard, mm -hmm. but it's also core. So it, it gives you that... It, 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 
because what it allows you to do, you can do this anyway, but actually what it um, legally binds you to do mm. is to then incorporate the, the the knowledge and wisdom of the whole of the international standards. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we've been arguing, one might say, or debating or uh, uh, working on incorporating the right to social security into the social security legislation as it's been going through Parliament. The, the purpose of doing that is that it legally binds Scottish Government ministers to, in, to, to consider and take into account the right to Social Security when it's making decisions about all the processes of regulation. Now, that hasn't happened within the legislation. Therefore, that is not incumbent on ministers to do that. There is no legal recourse if they'd fail to do that now or in the future. That's a real gap in the accountability mechanism in the legislation. And that means that the right to social security is at risk of not being fully realised, even though that is the stated policy objective of the legislation. So there's a hole there. And that accountability, that the, the right to social security within any um, within that, that process creates that hole. So, so, so yes, we would absolutely advocate for, for, for full incorporation, as I say, while recognising that it takes much more than just the law to ensure that people's rights are respected. Okay. Nora, I don't know if you had anything to, to, to add. Well, the EHRC is supportive of um, incorporation in principle. I think there are a lot of ways of doing it. And I would just like to uh, reiterate something that Judith just said, which is that a lot of times what is really key is um, how you implement it and that you have mechanisms that hold not just the Scottish government, but public authorities to account and create a system where there's some monitoring process. So it's not just something that is up to, I don't know, a specific public body to do, but that you actually are able to measure the impact of it and that people on the ground see a difference. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Uh, my questions follow on very much from Mary Fee's uh, questions on incorporation. Um, in respect of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, this Parliament and the well, the current administration have been on a journey with the UNCRC. I think the first time the UNCRC made it onto the Scottish statute books was in 2014, in the Children and Young People's Act, where there's a duty on ministers to raise awareness of. That was watered down from an earlier draft, which had a duty to raise uh, to have due regard. That's an important distinction, uh, because I, I'll give you an example, a granular example of the problem that we have. And there is a question in here, it might be a long intro, but um, we, this committee is dealing with uh, the Age of Criminal Responsibility responsibility bill, which we'll see are one of the areas which we have been out of step with our commitments to the UNCRC rectified. Within that, however, there is provision to take children to a place of safety um, in the situation where they are exhibiting offending behaviour, which is a police station. And that is uh, absolutely incompatible with Article 37 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So um, the, there is clearly, if we were, if ministers already had the duty to have due regard, we would not have that draft legislation suggesting that we actually um, house children in a police station for 24 hours because that's not compatible. So my question is, um, if we are to make rights real in the case of children, as we we're discussing just now, do we need to have a structure or a body within government that is checking all the silos of government to see that we are not making um, spectacular errors which bring us jarring up against our commitments to the convention? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Nick can answer this on the specifics, but indeed we do, and right across all convention rights, not just the CRC. At the moment, the competence within government would pr particularly rest around the rights enshrined in the Human Rights Act and the European Convention of Human Rights. These are restricted rights, as in they are restricted to the civil and political rights. Um, they are, do not cover the rights across but either the uh, Convention of the Rights of the Child or the, the rights that are covered by the other, the international human rights framework. So it's partial. And that, that creates a problem. So it means that actually the competence and expertise, it's not that that competence isn't there, but it's not fully, it's not fully, it's not as rich um, as it would be under, under the European Convention. And so the, that capacity within government to fully interrogate 
any process, policy, legislation, from the perspective of the treaty, um, is 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 at the moment limited. So yes, I would I would say that that needs to be bolstered in order to ensure effective uh, delivery around the, the, those recommendations. And I think probably what's what's important is is however you choose to do that, the the responsibility to ensure that legislation is rights compliance um, when it's drafted uh, rests with the whole of the Scottish Government. So um, I, would, I, would, I would agree that um, building up capacity, um, building up um, resource and encouraging these things to be considered much more carefully um, is absolutely critical, but um, I wouldn't want to go to a place where we had too much of a silo being developed in terms of um, these kinds of issues. I think for any bill team um, anywhere in government that's drafting legislation that impacts on children's rights, um, an understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and other international instruments um, where children's rights are, are, are kind of held um, is absolutely critical. Um, you, can, you can access resource and expertise from, from elsewhere, um, but that consideration needs to be mainstreamed right the way through government. The other point, I think, um, is that uh, it's also clearly the role of um, this parliament um, to scrutinise legislation really, really robustly, to look at the compatibility um, of legislation with UNCRC and other international instruments with those provisions, um, to make use of the, um, the powers um, and the authority that, that committees have um, to hold government to account um, against the, the, the provisions of international instruments. Um, so I'm, I'm all for um, building that kind of consideration in much more robustly at an earlier stage. Um, but there's also a really powerful role um, that the Scottish Parliament and its committees can play in ensuring that, that those issues um, on, on bills like the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill um, are properly reflected and children's rights have been given proper consideration. Um, one of the ways of doing that might be to look at the, the children's rights and wellbeing impact assessments that are increasingly being done uh, to accompany legislation um, and to, to really dig into them um, and for the committee to, or committees to scrutinise those um, a lot more closely and a lot more robustly, to really interrogate the work that's been done in considering what is the impact on children's rights of this legislation, what has been considered um, at that drafting stage. Um, and what kind of challenge does need to go back to, to the government in terms of um, accountability and its responsibilities in terms of international um, obligations. And just, and just to reinforce that point, one of the reasons we are so keen to engage in this inquiry is because the parliamentary role and the, if, if parliament brings human rights front and centre to its scrutiny processes, that will impact on all the policy development processes way before anything gets to parliament. If the policymakers know that that's going to be the, one of the lenses through which the parliament looks at legislation, they will have to do that in advance. And so it's an up, it, it, both, it needs to be an upfront process as well as at the end of the line. We don't want it to come to the stage where you're, you're, the parliament is having to do that at the end of the, end of the day. It needs, it needs to, it will, it, it will affect the whole process right through from policy development to the end of the point. So that, but all of that has to start somewhere. Um, and so the parliament is a really important um, uh, actor in that, that whole dynamic. Thank you, Gamina. Um, I should have said at the outset to remind um, members of my register of interest in the fact that I was convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights and worked in the children's sector for 15 years. Um, just on that, on that very topic about how we um, stitch that thread of human rights through all the policy work, not just of the parliament, but of government when it's generating it as well. I mean, this committee is very good at sort of generating outputs. And one of the outputs I want to see of this is a set of recommendations that we can take forward to Parliament and to government. I think one of the things that we're getting around to is the idea that each committee will probably need some kind of human rights rapporteur. But it, does that need to be mirrored in the silos of government as well? So that we have, the, in, when we have bill teams, for example, that there should be in each bill team, irrespective of the department or the interest or the field um, that, that, that has an expertise in, or an understanding of hum, human rights training and our current obligations, whether we've incorporated or not, to the various international treaties that we are uh, signatory to. Um, can I speak to the, my background as a lawyer, which yeah. I, I, do, I do believe that, that, that human rights, that capacity building around human rights legal experts is very, very important. 
I believe that, um, that the lawyers that advise the committees um, that are part of the parliamentary a commission body that they have to have that expertise so that the, the capacity is there to enable the committees to get the proper advice that they need to scrutinize legislation so i think capacity building in the parliament uh, there's a number of, of elements around that but certainly to scrutinize to in order to ask the right questions and and to test properly you need the proper legal advice and you need that expertise I think um, the other thing that I, that I would say in terms of your comment about creating a body, um, ownership has to, has to be spread in a small jurisdiction like Northern Ireland, for instance. We cannot keep creating new bodies. There, we have a children's commissioner, we have a human rights commission, um, and, and there are, there's a victims commissioner. So you can't keep creating new bodies, but what you can do, and what I think the example in Northern Ireland between the joint working between my office and the Human Rights Commission, is you can capacity build and get that um, expertise by joint working with your scrutiny bodies. And one of the things that I have um, begun as, as part of my mandate, I'm just two years uh, in the role of Ombudsman, is I've actually now established an oversight forum in Northern Ireland where the, the Human Rights Commission, the Ombudsman, the Children's Commissioner, the Equality Commission can meet. And, and in their roles, that is capacity building also, to make sure that if prison social care isn't being dealt with properly in, in by one commission, or there's an issue that needs looking at in relation to children's rights, I have own initiative powers, that that is being picked up. So capacity building around using what you have is important. Um, as well as thinking about, uh, are the lawyers skilled up? One of the things that I learned very recently, which I, um, I had to attend a workshop in the European Commission, was that the directorates there that are, um, that are um, they have a number, they, they're all lawyers basically, so they are experts. And they're experts in the field of agriculture, rights, environment so they have the director generals and they're all they're all lawyers and they i just discovered they're quite happy to give opinions to give opinions that are are close to what the european court of justice would say on particular issues and and that's the sort of capacity building i would suggest which is use what is there if there is an issue about interpretation or conflicting rights use the, what is there go to the experts in europe uh, or and and then ensure your capacity building locally. I had just a, a slightly different line of questioning now, specifically starting with yourself, Marie, if I may. Um, in, you said in your opening remarks, and thank you for coming all the way over to see us, um, that you as Ombudsman really are there to hold public uh, service delivery bodies to account. Um, what sanctions can you uh, employ on those that you find wanting in, in a rights perspective? I can merely recommend i you know and but if i recommend if my recommendation is not followed for a change in practice or procedure then it is to the northern ireland assembly that i would bring a special report in practice 99.9% .9 of my recommendations i have no binding powers but in practice and there is a convention that the ombudsman's recommendations are met Having said that, in my legislation, in my mandate that I have in Northern Ireland, there are two external mechanisms that, that can allow individuals who feel that they have, that the governance in a public body has let them down around the decisions that are made behind closed doors. So that if I find maladministration, as I call it, which is a failure in good governance, the individual can take my report go to the court, county court in Northern Ireland, get unlimited damages, and also can ask the court to injunct or tell a public body to do or stop doing something. That is a very powerful enforcement mechanism. I can also go to the Attorney General in Northern Ireland and say, Mr Larkin, QC, 
I have found systemic maladministration. There is a practice that is continuing that is maladministrative. There is a failure to have regard, for instance, to human rights in a particular hospital trust, in a particular issue. I can go to the Attorney General and say, will you take my issue to the High Court and seek High Court relief? No other ombudsman, as I know in the UK or in Ireland, have those powers. But I do think that while I can merely recommend, I have the backup of the courts and the Attorney General. I think I'd probably speak for the committee in saying that we hope that we can change that for Scottish Ombudsman as well. Um, thank you very much for that. The corollary to that then, and, and the other panel members might want to pick this up as well, is... Um, if we had incorporation, not just of the UNCRC, but other treaties as well, then do you think that your job would be made easier because uh, public service delivery bodies would realise that they might actually face um, prosecution or a challenge through the courts when rights were denied um, and, and that you might not have to um, make as many recommendations as you do? Uh, that, that is always a debate that, that we have. Um, I think having the law is is uh, important it's an import it's always important it's always a starting point but i think that um that the um that the law has to be given life to by policies and procedures that embed human rights in public bodies so you have the law as a starting point but there must be some um some clothes on that skeleton of the law so that there are policies and procedures. And that's where I as Ombudsman come in in Northern Ireland because if there is no policy around a particular issue, as I find in one case around primary school children, that the allocation uh, of uh, collateral places to primary schools, the allocation of extra places was being uh, applied inconsistently. One primary school were getting extra places, another primary school wasn't. When I asked the Department of Education, where is your policy? A basic good administrative process. They had no written policy. So how do you apply your criteria in the decision making as to whether this primary school gets it or that primary school gets it? How do you apply consistently and fairly the criteria to make that decision? There was no written policy. So I, I do believe that you need the law, but also that you have to give life to the law and public bodies should be doing that in terms of their policies, procedures and processes. Otherwise, when it comes to that decision making, it, it, that, there, there will not be the backup. Uh, and therefore, if there is no written policies and procedures, therefore scrutiny is more difficult. Because there's no one to hold. Holding someone to account in relation to, have you met the policy, have you met the procedure, that holding to account requires that, that there is good governance that supports the law. I just wanted to add um, that one of the ways we've been working is, for example, through the standards developed by public authorities in Scotland, by the inspection regimes in Scotland, whether that be the prison inspection regime, the care inspectorate, um, and really building human rights into standards so that the conversations that are being had when places are being inspected are using a human rights lens. Now, the... the I, there's, I, think, I, I'm, I don't want to speak out of term, but the, the, prison, the new prison inspection standards, I think, will, will, will be worth um, looking at in, in Scotland to really see um, how human rights have been absolutely integrated into that process. And for me, potentially, that's a, an, an example of really good practice where you begin to see public authorities really engage meaningfully with the material um, and use it to guide and then drive practice change within those different settings. So that's a really, I mean, it's a really constructive, uh, good practice example from our perspective. Um, so what I was going to add to that is, in our submission, we mentioned equality and human rights impact assessments. And I think that's one way for public bodies, for example, to uh, when they come up with policies to ensure that they keep equalities and human rights in mind. And in that sense, it's very important to state that um, you can't really look at one of them without looking at the other. So when you look at human rights, it's important to look at equalities and the other way around. But when you implement these processes or come up with them, it's really important that you don't just create a tick box exercise. So you need to get uh, people engaged and actually think about the issues. 
Mary, did you have a quick supplementary? Yes, yes, I did. And, it, and it's a specific question to, to, to you, Marie. When, when you spoke about the powers and the authority that you have as Northern Ireland Ombudsman, how did you get them? Did the Northern Ireland Assembly le legislate for them? Yes, they did. And, 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 and be before you, f you follow up, could, other, could the Scottish Government, or for example, legislate that our Ombudsman had the same powers? Well, I, I, it's a long time since I looked at the Scotland Act, but I think that that is a devolved matter, yeah. and I think that you can. Um, it was as a result of a, a review and a, a reform of the office, which was long, long overdue. Uh, a, 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 an external review report was commissioned by the former office of the First and Deputy First Minister. It sat for a while. Um, when I became Deputy Ombudsman in 2009, um, the government were not particularly interested in developing um, the ombudsman role. But I wouldn't say they weren't interested. What I'd say is they hadn't got the legislative resource in the Office of the Legislative Council. So we actually went and spoke to the committee, and we asked the committee to use their legislative powers to bring the legislation that was needed in Northern Ireland to reform and modernise the office of the Ombudsman and give the Ombudsman the powers uh, that they need. So it was actually a committee of the Northern Ireland Assembly that developed and led on the legislation. Well, that begs the question, actually, Mary, in follow-up to yours, to Judith, about the powers that you have and, and is... I mean, I've seen you nodding vigorously when you said, yes, you can do this, which I suspect means please do it. Um, but maybe if you could give us a wee bit of insight into the powers that you have and what you need maybe to, to build on that. Um, our powers are, in many respects, for a Human Rights Commission internationally, relatively limited. So we have the power to, our general mandate is to increase, uh, 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 develop public awareness and um, support for human rights um, and to increase public understanding of human rights. Um, we have specific powers of inquiry, um, which enable us to inquire into Scottish public authorities and their practices when we deem there to be risk of human rights. Um, abuses. Uh, we can't investigate um, uh, one public authority. There are limits on that, so I'll not go into the detail, but there are limits on that. Um, and additional to that, within that, in power of inquiry, we have the power to um, enter places of detention uh, uh, to, if, if, if that's clearly the subject of the inquiry, um, to investigate whether or not uh, uh, human rights abuses are taking place. Um, and we have the power to compel evidence. Uh, we have no power to... Uh, we can make recommendations, but have uh, no additional power to ensure that those recommendations are being held to by, um, by any of the public authorities or... To the Lord Advocate, for instance, the way uh, Marie can go to the Attorney General in Northern Ireland? Um, uh, to be honest... Uh, we probably could. I don't think it's specific. it's not ruled out, <laughs> so uh, it, it's not. We, it, it doesn't say we can't. So we could, but we have no. Um, it's not uh, mandated for within our legislation. But as I say, it's not ruled That's out. The That's the um, uh, I'm just trying to think. What, and the final power we have is the power to intervene in civil cases. We have no power to take a case. We can't raise a case ourselves in the courts in Scotland. Um, we can't take strategic litigation. Um, we can only intervene in cases uh, from a human rights perspective uh, with the permission of the court. OK. OK. That, that's good, interesting of our stuff. our legislation. <laughs> work to do. Excellent. Um, we've only got, a, a, as I say, a few, a few minutes left. We've got a tight schedule this morning. I'm going to move on to David. Uh, Torrance, who is going to hit you with a pretty substantial uh, issue, and you'll understand the minute he says the word Brexit. David. Uh, thank you for that, Convener. <laughs> um, with Brexit less than a year away, do you, does the panel think that human rights will progress the same as the EU, or is there a possibility that uh, the less, they'll be lessened because of that exit? So, uh, I, well, I'm sure we all have views. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, the, the, what, what coming out of the European Union does is remove us, and, and the legislation from the withdrawal bill removes us from the Charter of Fundamental Rights in relation to the European Union, um, uh, which removes a backstop of protection to our laws um, in relation to uh, how we deliver and implement them. So, in, in 
strict human rights terms, the impacts of coming out of the European Union on, the, on day one are relatively limited. Um, the risk, therefore, is what happens after that, because that backstop of protection is not there. We're no longer bound by the Charter. Um, then the, 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 the UK government has the mandate or the authority to roll back on those rights um, uh, in the future. Uh, and there are, uh, I'm sure um, Nora will talk, uh, be able to talk uh, uh, from an EHRC perspective on how they've advocated or tried to advocate at Westminster to prevent that. For me, that's one of the issues which is at the heart of this inquiry. It's not the only reason for the Parliament becoming a more effective human rights um, a guarantor, but it is one of the reasons that without that backstop that the EU framework provides, we are still members of the European Convention of the, Euro of the Council of Europe, but um, uh, increasing the competence, the capacity, the knowledge and the skills of MSPs, of the parliamentary system, of government around human rights, um, from my perspective, gives a general... Um, well, just increases that capacity so that when you're looking at legislative processes, whether they be ones developed in Westminster or more likely, clearly, ones developed in Scotland, you, you're able to see the human rights implications or the, potentially the erosion of rights or the what, what we would be looking for, the development of those rights. Um, and and that, for me, is, is, is one of the, I suppose, pressing reasons um, why we would be very keen to see capacity of the Parliament um, strengthened in relation to their human rights analysis. Marie, yes. Nora, I'm going to come. I'm go I'll come to you first, Nora, actually, because I think a more substantive point from Marie about, on the back of David's question. Nora, sorry. I think I can't comment on Scotland. Oh, sorry, but, uh, sorry. The, 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 do you want me to, to deal with that now, issue? Can I get maybe ask Nora to, yes, to, no, to just compliment what, what Judith has just said yes. and give her own points, and then I want to come back to you on a right. really substantial okay. point as well. Ruth said um, the EHRC has done quite a lot of work trying to ensure that the Charter um, is included in the Withdrawal Bill so that it gets translated into domestic UK law. Um, part of the reason for that, or the main reason for that, is because the Charter does um, protect certain human rights that we will lose um, once we lose the Charter, or there will be less protection for the rights that we do have. Beyond that, as Judith said, there is the potential for the UK government to regress on quite a lot of rights once we leave the European Union. So a lot of it depends on what happens after Brexit and the kind of developments we see after Brexit. Um, I think, I mean, with a lot of human rights issues, they're so complex and they're so broad. Um, so, for example, environmental protection can have a huge impact on human rights issues. So it really goes beyond maybe issues that we first identify as human rights issues and looks at a very broad set of policies that might change quite dramatically after Brexit. And I think that's part of the problem with um, this whole process, um, that there's so much that we don't know and it's so difficult um, for even experts in the field to get an overview of what will happen after Brexit, what is the situation, just because um, we've had these laws for 40 years and we're not really sure what will happen afterwards, um, what kind of legislation we will see, or really what the full implications of things are. David, I'm going to let you back in in a wee second, but Marie, the, the, the the, the issue around about the Charter of Fundamental Rights is something that was fundamental to the Good Friday Agreement and the set, setting up of, of the, the Northern Ireland Assembly and all, all of the things that came with it. And I, th I, I suspect because the Human Rights Act was a very key element of the Good Friday Agreement, that's, that's maybe where this, your thread is maybe a bit stronger when it comes to human rights through <coughs> your, your public bodies. But um, I, I wondered whether you could give us some insight as to where you are in Northern Ireland on this. Um, and, and obviously you've got the discrete issues around about the Good Friday Agreement and the Charter being um, one of the, the foundation um, bases to that. As I recall, the, um, the provisions of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 that required public bodies in Northern Ireland to um, in, in ensure that they complied with the convention rights, that that actually came in ad in advance of the Human Rights Act um, 1998. So actually, Northern Ireland was ahead 
at that point of the rest of the UK in relation to um, incorporation uh, and uh, of the convention rights. I, uh, what I would have to say is Northern Ireland, the constitutional settlement that was achieved by the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement at its heart had the protection of, of human rights of all the people in Northern Ireland at its centre. So I, I do believe that, that as legislation and, and whether the Human Rights Act is, is, is repealed or not, is that there is a culture in Northern Ireland of rights holders, as, as my colleagues would describe them, that is individuals being aware of their human rights and it being fundamentally part of their, um, it's what they seek, it's what they expect. We talk, uh, and we, I say we, the community of, uh, of you know, equality, human rights and, and ombudsman, we talk about mainstreaming, which is the real challenge, isn't it? It's getting a culture that respects uh, human rights and protects so that it becomes second nature almost. But I do think that human rights is, uh, is already, at, as part of the constitutional settlement, and all the work that has been done, great work that has been done by the Human Rights Commission in Northern Ireland, by, by the Northern Ireland Assembly and the other um, institutions, uh, that I do believe that there is a mainstreaming of human rights. What I would say is that the, the challenge for Northern Ireland is, is around issues of ensuring that that continues and and obviously what happens with the border is a political issue and one that I can't comment on, but it does, um, it does raise concerns. I would say the, the um, Chief Human Rights Commissioner, Les Allenby, in his annual statement recently to the Northern Ireland Assembly on the state of human rights in Northern Ireland flagged certain areas where there were gaps as regards to the protection of human rights. So what is going, going to happen? While there is, I believe, a lot of excellent work that has been done and that people's expectations of their rights being protected and them being able to vocalise that, particularly when they come to offices like mine, they will raise human rights issues. The, we, we can't underestimate the effect that the lack of resources has. You cannot underestimate where we have been um, fiscally and financially for a long period of time. And... That, I think, does, that is a challenge. You know, leave aside the Human Rights Act. You know, if you're a health trust and your budget has been cut or you are, are having to do your patient, uh, your patient's are, demands are rising and your budget is even just staying still, then the reality is that, you know, human rights may not be at the top of your agenda. So the, 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 the challenge of the, the financial difficulties and the recession that we've now experienced for such a long time is a significant one. And, and then the competing rights debate become, well, we're trying to do the, our best. We're, you know, we're stretched. We're trying to do our best here with what we've got. So that's, that's just my reflection. That's helpful. It's very helpful. David, final point. Marie's actually answered it. That's the question. Marie's answered it. There you go. Answer, so thank you. Any other further points from any of the panel? Is there anything that you had on your agenda this morning about an issue that we've not touched on that you would want to say? If the, the committee with the Human Rights Manual that um, the International Ombudsman's Institute has supported us on producing, and it's an investigation manual with human rights uh, screening tools that might help when you come as a committee to, to scrutinise using a human rights-based approach, if that is the way you want to go. Wonderful. Yeah. We always like a present. We always like a present. Judith. And just one thing. Final thing. We noted in our written rec um, evidence that the, the human rights mandate of this committee is only for the extent of this parliamentary term. Clearly, one of our absolute recommendations is that that be extended in perpetuity, and we hope that that would be a recommendation of the report of this committee. Indeed. <laughs> we noted that one. Excellent. <laughs> Nick, Nora, is there any final points? Just, just one very, very specific point around um, around the Brexit question, which was that the um, our office has has consistently had concerns that throughout this process, children's rights um, haven't been part of the discussion. Um, children and young people haven't been involved 
um, haven't been informed. Um, the, the Commissioner issued a, a letter um, in partnership with the, um, the European Network of Children's Commissioners and Ombudsmen, um, which articulated some of those, um, some of those concerns, and, and that, I think, continues to be a concern. So the, the idea that um, children's rights haven't really been part of this discussion at all, um, and, and that does cause us concern about what happens post-Brexit. Yeah, good point. Well made. Nora? Um, I have two points. One is um, on Brexit as well, so it's partly related to what Nick and Mary have said just now. Um, of course, we also have con serious concerns around the uh, uh, loss of funding for a lot of projects, and a lot of times it might be things that aren't specifically linked to human rights, but as part of the requirements for receiving the funding in the first place, you need to uh, adhere to certain criteria, and those criteria look at things like um, accessible, I don't know, bus stops and um, issues like that. So there are a lot of human rights connected to um, the loss of that funding. The other point is um, I would just want to briefly cover sort of the remit of the EHRC and SHRC. So we are the national equality body for Scotland, England and Wales, but we also are um, a national human rights institution, just like the SHRC. And the way we sort of split up our work um, quite nicely reflects the evolution. So with a lot of the treaty monitoring work, we'll work closely together with the SHRC. And I think treaty monitoring work is something that the committee should really look at and specifically focus on follow-up work. So it's, it's nice to get involved in the process and with the different uh, treaty bodies and the UPR process, but it's really important to follow that up. And um, there are a few things that you could look at. So you could, for example, invite um, the relevant minister to come to a committee session and question him um, a few months after the concluding observations have been issued and sort of go like, well, what are you doing? What have you done so far to address the various concluding observations? And when you sort of um, establish a process of doing that, that's something that the Scottish government will anticipate and they will make sure that by the time they come to you, they will have something to say and they will have done something. Um, so yeah. Yep, no, it's a really good recommendation and one that we've already uh, started because we did have the cabinet secretary here as a, a and probably a running agenda item on the UPR. Um, so we've we've already started that to establish that pattern. And you're absolutely right. Um, if they expect to be here, <coughs> then we expect to hear some answers and responses. So um, no, it's a, a point very well made and, and something that we're already undertaking. But um, any further advice on that would always be gratefully received. I'm going to suspend committee now um, but I want to say thank you to our panel this morning um, uh, we are going into another bigger panel with lots of other discrete interests but we're really grateful to you all for coming along to represent your uh, um, at your interests and um, Marie we're very grateful for you to come in from from Northern Ireland you've given us given us a perspective uh, on um, how things are maybe done a bit differently elsewhere that, that we can tap into and use some of that for our recommendations but we've got great recommendations from all four members this morning and we're really grateful for that and if you go away and you say, think, I should have said that, please let us know, because we're doing this inquiry for a, a while now. Uh, so we're keen to hear um, all aspects and, and anything that you think would uh, improve the lot of the Scottish Parliament becoming that guarantor, I think, that we all want to see. So thank you. I'm going to suspend now for 10 minutes. OK.
Uh, good morning and welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee and continuing on from our first agenda item this morning which is an inquiry on human rights and the Scottish Parliament. We have our second uh, larger panel with us this morning. Uh, we have um, a huge panel, as you can see, in a round table format. Um, a few rules of the round table format catch my eye and I'll let you in. Um, but we try to make it as free flowing as possible. But we've got some members who, as you can see, are dotted around the table who have got some specific questions. And if you heard some of the panel this morning, you may have some idea of where we're going with with some of this, um, the inquiry that we are undertaking. So with us this morning, we've got Gordon McRae, who's the Chief Executive of the Human so Humanist Society, Anthony Horan, who's the Director of the Catholic Parliamentary Officers of the Bishops Conference of Scotland, Delia Henry, who's the Director of Charity Services at Age Scotland, Ali Thompson, who's the Director of Dignity and Dying, Bill Scott, Director of Policy at Inclusion Scotland, Lucy Mulva, who's the Director of Policy and Communications, Health and Social Care Alliance, Graham O'Neill, who's the Policy Officer at the Scottish Refugee Council, Michael Clancy, who's the Director of Law Reform at the Law Society of Scotland, and Helen Martin, who's Assistant General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Unions Congress. We decided just to bring you all together because, you know, you've got such, um, you know, aligned uh, um, interests um, that we thought it would be quite interesting. You no, know, you can see actually you all have a very, very discreet role. Uh, and, and in many ways in, in all of the rights-based approaches that we take to anything uh, in Scotland. So that's why you're all here and we're really keen to hear from you this morning. I'm going to go to an opening question first. Um, but as I say, just try and catch my eye. And, and when you jump in, you can tell us a wee tiny bit about your organisation uh, and then hopefully then answer the question. And I'm going to start off with Alex Cole Hamilton and then Gail. Thank you very much, convener, and welcome to the panel. It's great to have such a diverse range of experience and views around the table. Um, this committee is charged with the observance of human rights in every walk of life, in every stage of life, and their uh, delivery through public policy and the implementation of that on the ground. But it strikes me that, and it has always struck me, that we have a suite of human rights that we look to international treaties for, which cover every aspect of our lives save one, and that is the end of our lives. Now, I want the, to ask the committee and the, the panel members present whether they agree with my view that should I reach the end of my life in unendurable pain, beyond the reach of palliative care, that I should have the right to say, this far and no further, and be assisted through any means necessary to quit this life with dignity. Ali, I think that one's quite clearly directed at you. <laughs> yes, um, I'm here representing Dignity and Dying Scotland, and we believe in the right to a good death for everybody, including the option of an assisted death for terminally ill and mentally competent adults. What we believe very strongly is that those at the end of life in Scotland at the moment, there is a small but very significant number of people who are experiencing a very bad death. We have stories every day, coming, people coming to our organisation. Um, a lady recently came saying it took her mum 12 days to die without um, when nutrition and fluid were withdrawn. That was an agonising 12 days. She experienced endless pain and suffering that was really needless. It did not have to happen in that way. If you look around um, the world at the moment, we can see that many other jurisdictions are taking, are actually looking at what rights people should have at the end of their lives and are taking action, action that really needs to be taken in Scotland. At the moment, we know that one person goes to Dignitas every eight days from the UK and figures from England show that last year there was 300 um, people, um, of all the suicides that there were in England, 300 of those, that's 7%, involved someone who had a terminal illness. The fear of pain and suffering at the end of life are driving people to take their own life. We also have a situation where dying people's loved ones, their family and friends, can potentially be criminalised for the act of helping them with their dying wish, either through travelling with them to Switzerland or, or here. We don't have any guidelines for any... Um, loved ones in Scotland, unlike DPP guidelines in England and Wales. The state of Victoria in Australia, which is a very similar population to Scotland, 7 million, recently took action and introduced a very safeguarded bill that manages to, like Oregon, that's had legislation for 20 years, really empower dying people at the end of their life 
whilst providing the very vital and necessary protections and safeguards to groups of people in society who may feel vulnerable by such legislation. On that safeguarding point, at the moment there are no safeguards other than a police interview after the act of death has happened. What we favour is very much a compassionate and safeguarded bill that would <coughs> empower dying people, give them access to the human rights that they so desperately need, but also protect those in society. We know it's a very popular um, campaign. We've got 77% of people in Scotland really back this, and we think this parliament <coughs> can take action, it's empowered to take action, and we believe very strongly that it should. Bill, I think, Bill, did you want to come in, Anthony, did you want to come in as well? Yeah. Bill. Yeah, um, it wasn't really what I came here to discuss. I thought we were going to be talking about human rights uh, and how the Parliament could help uh, everybody in Scotland access those human rights, um, but we'll have to reply. Um, at the moment, and there's certainly no unanimity amongst disabled people, a number of disabled people support the right to die, but uh, our policy position at the moment decided on by disabled people themselves is that we would oppose th that on the basis that every bill that's been brought before this parliament has had a scope well beyond um, what has just been described um, and would include disabled people uh, with non-terminal conditions uh, who were living in pain, uh, etc. Um, and I really want to discuss uh, how this parliament assists disabled people to live rather than to die, uh, because there are hundreds, no, sorry, tens of thousands at least of disabled people in this country who are living without dignity and respect because their, their right to independent living and participate in society is being denied them. And I think that the parliament's job should be to uphold those disabled people's human rights, to live in, with dignity and respect and participate in society. Um, and yes, there should be better palliative care so that people do not die in needless pain. Um, but you know, I would much rather this parliament started to talk about how we uphold the right to life um, and live that life with dignity and respect, with adequate income. Because I can tell you right now, when 2010, 30% of those on what was then incapacity benefit had thoughts of committed suicide. Now it's 40%. 40% of every person claiming Employment and Support Alliance has had thoughts of suicide and some have acted on them. And there are certainly documented cases of hundreds of people who have committed suicide due to welfare cuts. And we are living in a society that imposes that level of deprivation on disabled people when they have a right to an adequate income. So, you know, let's talk about human rights, but let's talk about upholding the human rights of the tens, hundreds of thousands of disabled people who have suffered a loss in income because the austerity policies, which the UN itself has described as a human catastrophe, if it was a human catastrophe happening in another country, we would all be sitting around saying, what can we do to alleviate that? What can we do to address that? The Scottish Parliament needs to address those issues. And it needs because disabled people are suffering in the here and now, in their tens of thousands. And certainly I've had phone calls with people contemplating suicide because they've lost their, their, wealth, their welfare benefits. And I've had to deal with that. I and I, I understand where you're coming from, but I really do hope that this parliament and, and this committee takes more notice of the need to live rather than the need to die. Can I, re can I reassure you, <laughs> Bill, that this is a specific question that, yeah. that Alex wanted to come in with. We have got more, and I, I, I don't like to use the word general because they're not they're still specific, uh, but the wider issues around about human rights as well. But 
I thought just at the top of the meeting we could do deal with this one uh, and, and get into the other, some of the other substance. Alec, you wanted to just, quickly come back. Just in. to reassure Bill, absolutely, we will be covering a range of those topics you described. But I think that it's uh, we had a, a discussion in the margins of this committee when we were discussing this inquiry about the range that this and scope of this inquiry that it would undertake. And we are covering all of those issues you describe, and we are doing so very thoroughly. But for, for me and for other members of this committee, the elephant in the room is also the rights that are currently denied to Scottish citizens and for, for my part and the, the thrust of my question is clearly that I believe Scottish citizens should have the right to die but clearly you may disagree you in convention now you know that no that's that's <laughs> I, I, be that as it may it, it still strikes me as a missing human right there are I'm sure Anthony, like Anthony and uh, Gordon want, want to come in Anthony uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think first and foremost, nobody likes suffering, um, and there are some truly awful cases of people who have suffered greatly and want to end their life. And uh, Ali Thompson has has alluded to this, and uh, I don't think we can have anything but compassion and sympathy um, for those people in those situations. But I think that this is entwined with the concept concept of the common good, um, and I don't think the law can really be neutral on this matter. I think it either regards death as a therapy or it upholds the sacred, sacredness of all life, which Bill Scott so, so passionately spoke about a moment ago. I think proponents often speak about a, a narrow definition, but we are hearing um, of people being euthanised for, for addiction to alcohol. Um, there's concerns about people being a burden on their family. We know con there's concerns about uh, um, coercion and so on. Um, and I think that rather than condemn people to unnecessary suffering, we ought to enhance the quality of care for the dying, which again Bill Scott alluded to, that's through investment in palliative care. I, I don't think we should go down the road of making the vulnerable more vulnerable um, and of uh, risking trust between doctor and patient um, or even undermining, as I say, palliative care or for that matter, the Hippocratic Oath. So this is something I think we need to uh, think very, very deeply about um, and hear all of uh, all sides of the argument, which is something I, if I'm given the opportunity, I'd like to go on to a little later. Gordon. Um, I, I, I'm the Chief Executive of the Humanist Society in Scotland. We've got 15,000 members uh, all across the, the country. And our members very much support the principle of a dignified right to death uh, for anyone experiencing unbearable suffering. And, and what I think is interesting of the role, the new role for this committee, is that I think there is an undeniable you know, diversity of opinion among Scottish society. Most, most research, public polling research, says that people agree with the principle, majority of people in Scotland agree with the principle. Um, but I think it is reasonable to reflect on the two bills that have come before Parliament and say that there may have been a, a, a benefit to a broader inquiry into the, in, into the issue rather than just simply forcing a decision around a, a proposed piece of legislation. So I would certainly encourage the committee. I think there are, I mean, I, I, I don't think um, the, the circumstances that uh, disabled people in, in, in Scotland find themselves in, I don't think it's incompatible with the, the role of this committee to look, address both these matters. And, and certainly we would, we would share the, the horror of, of, of the impact of austerity uh, on people's lives. But I think the challenge now is how can we actually explore where Scotland sits on this on this issue? Uh, we have to take, a, I would argue, have to take an evidence-based approach to that. I think, you know, respecting uh, uh, Anthony's contribution, but you know, we can't just rely on things we've heard and there have been reports in other jurisdictions. There is evidence out there which compiled in a, in, in a committee inquiry, I think would be a very powerful way of allowing the arguments to be truly explored rather and, and maybe take some of the heat out of what can be, be, be quite a contentious debate. Yeah. Ali, I want to give you a very quick uh, response because Gail <coughs> Ross has got a much more general question which will allow everyone to come in on their specific points, but if you could give us a very quick reply. Of course, and um, that would be to say, similar to what Gordon said, we have evidence, we've got 20 years worth of evidence from Oregon that actually shows this is not a, a law that affects, it's not, there has been no extension to criteria being old or being disabled would not allow you an assisted death 
unless you also had a terminal illness. And again, I would support a wider inquiry into full end-of-life rights, including the right to palliative care and treatment. We firmly believe in assistance to live as well as when necessary and when there is no other option, when death is inevitable, assistance to die. Thanks very much, Alex. Good, good clue. Gail Ross. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning um, to all our panel members, and, and thank you to those who replied to that first question. I know that it certainly is a very um, emotional subject for a lot of people. I want to just, as the convener said, um, look a little more generally on human rights as a whole, and we have had a lot of good evidence sessions in the past about how we reach people in society to empower them and to make them realise that human rights is for everyone and not just certain groups of people. And you've all got specific remits with certain <coughs> groups of people in society. How do you reach these people to inform them of their human rights? And if they feel that their human rights have been violated, how then can you assist them in that? Delia. You don't need to touch anything. You don't need to touch anything. It's automatic. Sorry. Am I breaking the system? <laughs> okay, thank you for that. that that's actually um, Age Scotland. That's one of the things that we've been talking about a lot recently, exactly the principle that you've been uh, suggesting, Gail. Um, the EHRC in Scotland did a piece of work around uh, what does human rights look for people, building a human rights culture in Scotland. And the our demographic is 50 and over. If people around this table like me are over 50, you maybe not consider yourself an older person, but that's who we look at. I'm looking at his, seeing his turning, however. Um, but people 65 and over were conflicted by the term human rights, which we thought was very interesting. But it was very important to them to talk about values and equality and being treated well. So I think language is really important for people and understanding what human rights may well be for them as individuals and, for example, around care for older people. Uh, and this, uh, in Scotland, pe people have access to free care, uh, free personal care. But when that doesn't work for people, how you have an ability to respond to that, what you should do about it. And advocacy is really important for people. It's about getting independent advocacy, getting that kind of support. Certainly in each Scotland, we do that work. We talk to over 10,000 people a year. Um, and over half of those are about uh, care, um, free personal care, when it doesn't go right. So I think it's really important to do that. And to your point, it's, I think as a principle, if the parliament took the approach of telling people what their rights are, and supporting them to access that, that would go a long way to reinforcing human rights for older people. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't realise I was next. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think from, we, I represent uh, the STUC in Scotland, which is um, the trade union centre, and we have 560,000 uh, workers who are members of trade unions. And I think we spend a lot of time, obviously, trying to support people to access their rights in the workplace, and indeed as citizens. And um, we do a lot of um, engagement in, in different human rights processes. Um, we would um, submit evidence to the treaty review processes. We come, we submit evidence to this committee. Um, we go and we give evidence in Geneva as well when appropriate. Um, and I think for, for us in supporting our members trying to access their rights, one of the key sort of breakdowns that we see is that actually um, workers' rights are often not really considered within the human rights landscape by a lot of actors. Um, even though it is quite clear that economic and social, social and cultural rights are part of the human rights landscape, and it's, it's very clear that there are overlaps in various areas. When we start to talk about workers' rights, when we start to talk about um, trade union rights as well, in particular, uh, the idea that that is seen as, as a human rights that needs to be defended is something that we don't think um, 
is built very well into the human rights infrastructure in the country. So take, for example, when the trade union bill was passing through um, Parliament at the Westminster level. Um, it just so happened at that time that the ITESCAR treaty review was also underway. And um, we, for the trade union's part, were putting in quite detailed evidence about the trade union bill and about why that was a breach of, of, of human rights for workers in Scotland. And I think um, the ITESCAR treaty review body agreed with us that, that, that it certainly needed more scrutiny and um, it was certainly a, a worrying development. And organisations like Liberty um, were supporting absolutely the human rights arguments that we were making around that bill at the time. However, the Scottish Human Rights Commission made no, um, made no sort of comment within their evidence uh, to ITESCA about the trade union bill. The words trade union bill were not used in their evidence, despite the fact that treaty looked very much at trade union freedoms. So, and despite the fact that the, the bill was passing at Westminster at the time when the evidence was taken. And the explanation for that when we raised it with the Scottish Human Rights Commission was very much that it was a very marginal issue. They weren't, they weren't necessarily convinced that there was a human rights issue there, despite, the, despite all the um, representations we were making, despite the comments from Liberty, despite the fact the First Minister was making similar points about human rights and workers' rights. Um, so we, we just kind of feel that there is consistently, consistently this kind of gap between um, the view of the kind of things that would support our members in the workplace on the ground and um, the, the sort of human rights machinery that sits at the top, that often there's, there's just not quite a read across between um, the sorts of things that we work on on a day-to-day -day basis and, and how that human rights infrastructure supports us. Thanks, thanks, Helen. Lucy, you wanted to come in from your perspective. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Thanks for the opportunity to take part today. Really appreciate it. Um, um, for those who don't know the Alliance, um, the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland is the largest third sector intermediary for health and social care in Scotland. And we've got a very wide range of around 2,200, 2,300 members, um, uh, including people uh, who identify as disabled, living with long-term conditions, unpaid carers, um, but also a range of third sector organisations, community-based, right up to some of the big national players. We also have some health board membership, some of the health and social care partnerships are members and, and we also have got some corporate associate members. So we work with a very wide range uh, of people and organisations and really human rights sits very much at the heart of the work that we do, um, which is primarily um, focused on ensuring that the voice of lived experience is at the heart of policy and practice in Scotland. So it's very much a, a rights-based approach and a rights-based message. And some of the ways that we do that, uh, or work around rights, is, is through publications and consultations, events. Um, we co-convene the SNAP, Scottish National Action Plan for Human Rights, Health and Social Care Action Group, along with NHS Health Scotland. Um, so we, we feel like we're doing a lot of work to kind of inform people about their rights. I think one of the key questions about empowerment is that it's not just about informing people about their rights. It's also about facilitating people, facilitating and enabling people to um, enjoy those rights um, and to take the actions necessary to do that. And that's possibly where some of the issues around the situation in Scotland, the, the, the kind of key area is, is around the implementation gap between the rhetoric and the reality. On paper, I think one could say that um, uh, and the language in Scotland is very pro-rights and we very much strongly welcome that. Unfortunately, what we sometimes see is that doesn't actually match what people's experiences in their everyday lives are. There's some very live examples in health and social care at the moment around self-directed support and the integration of health and social care. I won't go into loads of detail about that, but happy to follow up with some evidence around that. An incredibly live um, um, example of that at the moment is around access to independent advocacy services and particularly discussions that are happening in the development of the Social Security Scotland Bill at the moment. Um, our understanding, and, and we're joined in this by over 70 organisations, including the Scottish Human Rights Commission and others, is that 
Um, the right to social security, uh, which is on the face of the bill at the moment, um, also includes our, a universal access to independent advocacy, without which you might not be able to realise your right to social security. And there's current discussions going on at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, it's looking like that right to access the services will be limited in the bill. So we would be looking to see, can we can get that extended in, in the real world? So, you know, People with disabilities obviously need independent advocacy or want independent advocacy at certain at certain points, but so do many other groups that are currently accessing social security entitlements. So that's one of these kind of live issues and areas where we think that the committee and other committees in Parliament could be really playing a very strong role at looking at what does the international framework and the international treaty say around the right to social security and how does that actually play out in the lives of people living um, in Scotland right now? Thanks. Oh, interesting. Michael Clancy. Thank you, convener. Um, uh, so I, th I think it's a very interesting question you've raised about how do we get people to know about their rights and how do we, uh, how do we get them not only to know about them but how to understand them? Um, uh, and... Uh, First and foremost, Scotland's solicitors, 11,000 plus, nearly 11,500 solicitors, uh, are accustomed to dealing with human rights on a day-in, day-out basis. And I say that because uh, our legal system uh, is based, to a great extent, uh, on the implementation of human rights in Scotland. Uh, the, there's a troika um, uh, where human rights, the rule of law and democracy act in concert to make sure uh, that we are um, uh, enabled in our society to fulfil our lives as humans. You talked about what is it, the connective factors between us all around this table. Well, we're all humans <laughs> and we all have rights, convener. Um, uh, and I think that, that that's quite an important, um, although trite, observation. Um, uh, but if I were to um, uh, sit some people down uh, in this room uh, and shine a light in their face and ask them uh, if they could enumerate all the articles in the European Convention on Human Rights, we might not get the answer we are expecting. Eh? Um, that's a possibility, including myself. Um, uh, but um, I think public legal education is something which goes to the heart of making sure that people are properly educated uh, and understand their rights in Scotland. Uh, and uh, we have uh, participated in a street law programme where we get uh, young student lawyers uh, into schools to teach uh, children um, uh, about the, the legal system and their rights. And we think that that's, that's quite a, a, a good process. Um, uh, similar programmes could be extended. The Parliament itself has a, an extraordinary outreach programme um, how many millions of people now have come through the doors of the Parliament? How many uh, uh, hundreds of schools each year come through the doors? Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, that the, the hard-working people in the, the visitor centre tell uh, the, the, uh, the visitors about the centrality of human rights to Scottish legislation. And that goes back to the devolution arrangements. Uh, so that within the competence of the Parliament, it cannot make legislation which is incompatible with uh, the uh, Convention rights. Uh, and that, I think, is where, um, uh, prior to devolution, uh, because of the nature of uh, legislation uh, from the UK Parliament, you knew that was the law. Yeah? You can't un undermine your, uh, UK legislation prior to devolution. Uh, but with the Scottish Parliament and its competence provisions, you have to ask the question when you see an, an act of the Scottish Parliament, you have to ask the question, is this the law? Is it compatible with human rights or EU law for the time being uh, uh, and all the other uh, restrictions and compatibility? So therefore, I think that that's quite important for us to remember that it is at the foundation base and it's a question we all has, have to ask ourselves. Um, is uh, the legislation which we are uh, seeing enacted in Scotland compatible with human rights? Uh, and uh, if it is, if it is, as most of it has been, uh, then uh, we can have confidence uh, that those rights, uh, as defined in terms of the ECHR, are being respected. Thank you, Michael. Um, Gordon. 
I just wanted to, to sort of pick up on that. And also, I, I was in earlier on and I heard something uh, Judith Robertson said as well. And I think one of the, one of the issues around how we empower people to use their rights is about making sure that, that we don't place too much of a burden on the individual at times to be the only person who can pursue them through the, through the legal system. And I think there are, we in the, the human society, we've had some direct experience of this uh, when we sought to take a judicial review of a decision around the rights of young people to opt out of religious observance. And we you know, effectively, to taste the human rights elements of that, it had to be a child who, who would take the case uh, a case that could have lasted longer than, than, than they would have been denied their rights. By the time the case had been called, they, they would have had that, that, that right anyway. Um, we also see it on the issue around um, uh, something that EHRC has identified around the, the uh, effective veto that some, uh, d some religious bodies have over teacher recruitment. Um, that's something that the EHRC have said they want to test in court, but cannot find a teacher who's prepared to, to go and be that test case. So I think there are occasions where we should be looking at how can we better m test the, the gaps in legislation? How can we make sure that culturally we view that as, as a constructive partnership between whether it's civic society um, or, uh, and government so that it's not seen as a, a confrontation because someone wants to take a case in principle? And we would certainly be supportive of uh, allow in, enhanced powers for strategic litigation for the, the human rights bodies in Scotland to allow that process to, to take place. And because that means that the rights are available to people when they need them. Uh, not, I mean, education takes you so far, you can know about them, but can you actually, can you actually manifest those rights? Can you exercise those rights? That has to be the test. Uh, really e excellent and interesting um, a aspect for the committee to look at. I'm going to go to Mary Fee now. Um, because her question follows on from all of this and I'll allow maybe some of the other um, um, uh, panel members to come in. Mary. Thank you very much, Convener. And can I start by uh, making an apology um, to everyone that's come along this morning? I have to leave in about 10 minutes because I've got a meeting um, to go to. Um, so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to ask what is quite a, a wide-ranging um, question, which would apply really to any committee across... Um, this, this parliament when we're doing any piece of, of, of scrutiny work. And, and the question is, I mean, all of you around this table represent um, different areas. You all have regards to different parts of um, human rights, but you all have an underlying obligation to everyone's human right. So as a parliament and as an individual um, committee, how does each committee, when doing its scrutiny work, ensure that whilst we take regard of one aspect of human rights, we don't ignore another one. Because if you have a panel in front of you, there will be a number of different competing human rights. And people, if anyone was at the, the, the previous panel, you'll have heard the discussion from the Northern Ireland Ombudsman when she talked about the competing rights of a young person and an adult, um, and which human right takes, takes precedence. Um, and, and this will be a, a, an area that I would imagine that every committee across the Parliament, when it's doing scrutiny work, will, will come across. Which human right takes precedence and how do we ensure that we don't ignore someone's? Helen. Um, yeah, I think I think there's uh, it's a it's a very interesting discussion really about um, how it is that we actually make human rights tangible for people, and I think uh, for our part this is this is a serious it's it's really goes to the heart of the question, and and I, I was very interested in the, in the previous discussion where we were talking about the idea that if the legislation is correct, that that somehow creates rights for people, and. Um, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that we have quite a lot of examples, actually, of legislation being being absolutely positive and absolutely correct, but the implementation of that legislation being um, ex extremely not necessarily poor, but but not necessarily delivering on the on the ground in the way that it should do. And I think. Um, a, a, a glance at the equal pay situation in, in Scotland shows quite clearly the, the sort of difference between having a, having a right in principle and having that right delivered. Um, we see thousands of women um, who have been fighting 
and have been taking cases and have been trying to actually assert their rights in the court of law, still waiting for justice. And we have seen systematic failures from government, from the EHRC, from, um, from councils, from politicians, um, in actually supporting uh, the realisation of equal pay. And USDA have prepared, or not USDA, sorry, Unison have prepared, prepared very, very good um, piece of research, actually, on exactly what has happened with equal pay in Scotland, um, which they have um, submitted to the CEDAW for, for the CEDAW Treaty, um, which I would really like to, to send a copy of the, to, to the committee for, because I think it sets out um, the timeline in quite some detail um, from the 1990s right up to the present day um, of how that legislation was taken forward. And it shows just how systematic the feelings really were and how many times there were to act um, to correct unequal pay, particularly in local government, and how that was not taken, and how you know action was taken by the EHRC at Glasgow City Council, and how that action was never published, and how that then contributed to um, to to the situation that we have today, where we've still got women who are fighting to to receive their compensation, and we have got women who have accepted poor deals in lieu of what they were owed. And I think when it comes to to come back to the question that you asked around committee scrutiny, when it comes to how we balance rights, I think we've got to remember that um, th we, we can be seeing systematic rights abuses, and we can see them so regularly that actually they become kind of part of the furniture and normalised. I mean, it, it's now normal to see women come and give evidence to you and to see them in not being paid properly for their labour. Um, and I think we've got to remember that when we're looking at things, we've got to try to think about what the world should be like. And we should be trying to think of the rights that people should have. And we should try to stretch ourselves to actually... Um, to actually insist that rights are upheld in the way that they should be. Because I think... The, it would be very easy to just normalise the sorts of rights abuses that actually are quite mundane within our society. And um, that would be really my plea to this parliament, because actually this parliament comes out quite well. You're one of the better actors that we have here. And you do work, I think, very, very hard to try to uphold those rights and to, and to put, tease out those arguments. So I would, I would um, ask that you would think really clearly about what it is that you can do to really try to, to take away that normalisation of rights abuse that we have in our We'll be keen country. to see that submission if yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'll send you, yeah. got it there. Well. Anthony, you wanted to come in. Bill, I've got, I've got you here. Anthony. Thank you. Um, first of all, the church doesn't uh, necessarily seek to provide concrete answers by way of um, specific policies and procedures. Uh, but we do hope to shine a light on broad principles and furtherance of human rights and we would proclaim the importance of human dignity. And whilst we believe this dignity to be transcendent, that is rooted in God, um, we appreciate that not everyone will necessarily hold that view. Um, but nonetheless, I believe that we can all work for human dignity and for the common good. Now, I think the fundamental point here is that all human beings um, and their human dignity must be protected. That's nobody can be left behind, nobody at all. And I think that highlights the problem which uh, Mary has brought to light. I think Dr. Kate Boyle said in the last evidence session at the end of March that we can all agree on some kind of understanding of human dignity as a basic component. I think that's an excellent point. Now, as I touched on, the church believes that human rights are found in the, in the natural law, so they're inscribed in the human heart. Now, in layman's terms, it basically means that deep down, every human being knows what's right and what's wrong. Um, and that may be alien to some, but there's surely some merit in believing that, at least in some matters, there's a universal truth that we can all agree on. Now, if I can just very quickly give a couple of examples um, of what I believe to be fundamental human rights. For example, the right to religious freedom, for people to manifest their faith, um, and the right to conscientious objection, the right to free speech. I think these are fundamental and uh, surely basic uh, human rights in a democratic society. The right to life is another one, and Alex Cole Hamilton at the beginning mentioned um, right to life at the, the end of life, but I'll drag it back to the beginning of life, if I may. Um, uh, I, it's no surprise that the Catholic Church believes in the fundamental right uh, to life from conception to natural death. It's an issue which attracts much controversy 
Uh, there's no doubt about that, and it's a very, very sensitive issue. But it doesn't mean we should shuck from it. Um, on the contrary, I think we have a duty to engage in respectful but vigorous dialogue in order to try and get to the truth of it. And I, so I would like to see this committee and wider parliament be open, more open to the views of all people with an interest in fundamental rights issues, such as the right to life, just to have a, a real deep and meaningful search for, for the truth in that issue. And I feel that there's sometimes a, a reluctance to tackle certain issues head on. And I think abortion is, is one of those. And there's, of course, there's, there's reasons for that. Uh, Alex Cole Hamilton touched on it at the last evidence session, suggesting that politicians traditionally shy away from controversial issues. And I think, I think this is very important. Many politicians are afraid for one reason or another to, to publicly take a view on controversial issues. And, and sometimes you think, who can blame them? Um, because some of the vitriol and the hate that, that public figures are subjected to through the media, and particularly on social media, uh, is appalling. But yet Parliament still has a responsibility, and it's a responsibility to have informed, respectful and honest debate on these issues. And I think this was never more evident than in the recent parliamentary de debate marking Down Syndrome Awareness Week. Um, a, a very honourable topic, uh, absolutely, and one which undoubtedly needs to be discussed. However, I, I must confess I was disappointed that a debate on the, the challenges facing people with Down Syndrome failed to really face up to the biggest challenge faced by those people, and that's that nine in every ten uh, unborn child in the UK with Down syndrome is aborted. Now, that's just one example. It's highly sensitive. I know there is a lot of emotion involved in this, but I think it just highlights the importance of why it needs to be discussed. And so I appreciate my call to greater openness and honesty can, uh, cannot rest on the shoulders of this committee <laughs> alone. But whether it's this committee or it's in the main chamber, I would like to see more open consideration and honest consideration, consideration of all the issues relating to human rights. And, and this ties in with, with what the question Mary asked, to make sure voices on all sides of the debate are heard. And I think that is absolutely critical when we're dealing with human rights. <laughs> Lots of people to come in. Bill, I've got you next. Thank, thanks very much, Anthony. Yep. As you, as you can imagine, we're trying to hear everybody's voices around the table yeah. this morning. So, um, Bill, I've got I've got you next, and then just so that you know, I've got um, Lucy and Graham. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself properly last time, but Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland. Um, we are a national disabled people's organisation, and human rights is fundamental to every aspect of our work. Uh, we wrote the UN shadow report for Scotland on implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. We gave evidence in Geneva, et cetera. But to answer Mary's question, when it comes to deciding between human rights, fundamental human rights, which are universal, uh, were devised after World War II because of the Holocaust, because the country's refusing to accept refugees and asylum seekers, uh, et cetera, during the war and the results of that and because of the, um, you know, the Holocaust actually involved disabled people as well. They were denied their right to life. Uh, they were the first to be gassed. Um, but when it comes to, to human rights, the UN and international society have decided that, as well as the universal fundamental rights, some groups in society need additional protections. And those are children, women and disabled people. Um, so when it comes to competition between human rights, I think what the committee should be striving for is equality outcome for those groups that are usually denied that equality outcome uh, by society. Um, and that, that means that in some cases, you do not treat people equally, you treat them with a view to achieving equality of outcome uh, for that individual. Because if you don't do that, then the inequalities in society remain. Those people's human rights are being denied because they cannot access the same rights that other people in society take for granted. Getting up in the morning, getting dressed, etc. The right to independent living does not feature in any aspect of Scottish legislation. But it's a one that's absolutely fundamental to disabled people because without it, they cannot participate in society, can't take part in politics, they can't 
get their voice heard. And we are a large, you know, member-driven organisation, 40-odd disabled people's organisations affiliated to us, the largest of which is 3,000 members. Uh, that's Glasgow Disability Alliance. When we take these uh, issues of human rights out, we use a human rights toolkit, which we devised, and which is an easy-read format, which means it can be easily understood not just by people with learning difficulties, but any member of the population. And it tells people about their rights under the UNCRPD, under the European Convention, and under the Human Rights Act, and also tells them how, how to go about accessing those rights. And again, I come to a fundamental question here. Rights are absolutely useless if people cannot access them. And I'd very much echo what Gordon had to say on that about test cases and about the inability of people accessing their rights. 75% of all the phone calls to the Equality Advice Service, um, you know, which is the national service to, to deal with phone calls, 75% of them from Scotland are from disabled people on disability discrimination. And there is a law centre for women, there is a law centre for uh, ethnic minorities in Scotland, and there is a children's law centre, but there is no law centre in Scotland for disabled people. There's nobody <coughs> specialises in this area of law. And I have to say, the reason that there are so many phone calls to that helpline is because many lawyers do not know what disabled people's rights are or how to go about enforcing them. And we have taken this issue to the Scottish Legal Aid Board and over and over again, we've been denied a law centre for disabled people. And I think that's something the Parliament should be addressing with the Scottish Legal Aid Board is, when are you going to act to address the inequality and in access to justice for disabled people in this country. Because we, you know, again, on many, many issues, we're being denied it. We actually took the bedroom tax case, not to the courts, but to the UN, to the uh, special rapporteur on housing, to get her to investigate it through a special inquiry where she visited Scotland, etc. And again, that's how you publicize human rights. You put the cases in the papers and you get people to realise that human rights are actually about basic, everyday things in life, like the right to a home and family life, which is being 80% of people who were affected by the bedroom tax were disabled people. A hugely disproportionate impact. Nothing done to address that dis disproportionate impact. And that's another thing I would say. In terms of quality impact assessments, the pieces of legislation coming before committees, Sometimes I laugh and sometimes I weep when I, when I read them because I do not think they're informed by equalities groups. You know, I think a civil servant sat there and gone, it's the same, out. It's, it's the same for everybody. You know, it'll, it'll, it won't affect people disproportionately. Yeah, it will, and often. And I think, I, I have to say, there have been good occasions when we've been invited in, equalities groups, and, and asked, what do you think the impact of this draft piece of legislation will be? But there's many, many occasions when we've never, never been asked, and, and I have to say the quality impact assessments, I do not think, meet the standards of human rights uh, compliance. Um, and I think that's something Parliament could maybe have a word with government about, about involving the third sector and the qualities and human rights organisations in that. One of the, the I speak for the committee here, and I think one of the issues that, that, that we grapple with is the quality impact assessments and we are now looking at quality and human rights impact assessments and if we've not got the first part of it right then we'll not get the second part of it right so uh, we, we are very mindful of that. Lucy if I can ask you to come in uh, uh, quite quickly then I've got Graham and then I've got Michael. Yeah sure thanks very much for the opportunity I think this is a it's a really key issue and something that we've um, addressed in our written response in the inquiry as well so there's more detail in that. Um, I think it was noted earlier on, you know, equalities and human rights, they're everybody's business. And so they do basically transcend every aspect of the Parliament's work and across all the committee's work. And so one of the things that we've asked for is to see progressive mainstreaming of explicitly dedicated time across each of the committees and other parliamentary work addressing equalities and human rights issues. Um, We've noted as well our support for the um, recommendations in the Michael Potter um, submission that was made for the committee as well as the Commission on 
parliamentary reform in terms of providing support for parliamentarians themselves, but also for staff in the parliament to increase awareness and understanding of international human rights frameworks, laws. Um, so not just um, at the European level, but, but at the UN level and what that actually means, but also um, the ability for um, committees, parliamentarians and, and parliamentary staff to avail themselves of independent expertise. And a lot of that independent expertise can lie within the third sector as well. Um, and we're always ready, willing and able to help with that. Um, I know mention was made earlier and discussion is made about um, SHRC's a proposal around human rights rapporteurs in committees. One of the things that we would advise about that is that we, we you know, we agree that that would be a, a, a good way forward, but we would need to ensure that that person's word held a certain amount of weight, obviously, within the committee, and that it doesn't negate the need for all committee members to kind of understand um, um, about international human rights laws and frameworks and, and so on. Um, penultimate point is that basically we think that one of the one of the great ways that members of committees can find out about what the reality is of rights is to meet with directly with rights holders we've done some fantastic work where we've managed to bring together members of the health and sport committee with members of our lived experience involvement network and we took a rights based approach to that so that involved supporting people with practical accessibility issues um, finance to cover transport and overnight stays in order to facilitate that meeting and we know that everybody involved got a huge amount out of that experience and it directly led to informing the committee's work around NHS governance um, so that was um, a really good bit of work. I suppose fi the final point is that really is that for all of this to happen, you could rely on it just happening organically or through osmosis by, by some way through this kind of debate and other ongoing discussions. But what we'd prefer to see is some quite concrete action. So a concrete action plan with, you know, smart objectives and perhaps some targeted focused outcomes to be able to work towards finance put against it. If it's not resourced, it won't happen. Um, and if it, you know, if, if it's not counted, it doesn't count kind of approach. Um, and again, I think there's a number of bodies that already exist, including within the third sector, like ourselves and, and our members, who are again very willing, ready and able to help with that process in any way we can. Thank, thanks, Lucy. Graham. Yeah, well, firstly, uh, just to, to introduce the Scottish Refugee Council, um, we are uh, one of the, the main refugee rights charities in Scotland and we, we deliver services to people in the international protection spectrum. Uh, so that is people who are trying to access the asylum procedure, people in the asylum procedure, people who have been recognised by the UK state as refugees, as well as people who have been refused recognition and therefore protection by the UK state as refugees. Uh, we also work with, with Syrians, uh, for families work have came through the the UK state's uh, humanitarian protection programme, uh, resettlement programme now uh, as well. And they uh, would deliver services and community engagement work with, with all of those communities. Uh, we do a substantial amount of policy advocacy work. We work at different levels of governance. So we work at uh, the European level, we work at the UK level, which is very difficult and challenging for us, which I'll get to in a second. And we also work at the Scottish level as well as locally, where, where things are a little bit more productive and uh, easier for us to get a uh, change and to, to get our priorities heard and the people we work with's priorities heard. Um, I just want to step back a bit from that and just to say firstly that, you know, we, we've really welcomed this committee's work. It, it, done a, it done what we thought was a really well regarded and impactful inquiry into destitution uh, as it affects asylum seekers as well as people with insecure forms of immigration status. And, and, and I say that partly because I think that's an example of the Scottish Parliament not being bound rigidly by devolved competence and recognising that, as it did with issues like trafficking as well, that, you know, that things that are asserted to be reserved aren't actually in practice and certainly not in the daily life of people in Scotland. Reserved social security would be another example. I think also when we ask the question about human rights and what can we do about it, 
inherent to me and I think to many other people in this question and certainly I agreed with what Helen was saying and Gordon as well is that we need to have an analysis of power relationships because that's inherent in human rights if rights aren't practically accessible to people then they aren't rights at all um, and, that, and, and that needs to be the test that we work from rather than some theoretical exercise uh, I think flowing from that is the emphasis on prevention and the emphasis on not putting the onus, as Gordon articulated earlier, on the individuals. There's no, no more conservative of a small c intervention that one can make as if you put the onus on the individual. And if one looks at the history of any discrimination legislation, that is one of the key, you know, uh, asks and pushes from all campaigners, be it from, you know, for the Race Relations Act, through to the Equal Pay, through to sex discrimination, through to disability discrimination. So why would it be any different now? And of course, we're looking at what's happening at the moment, very topical in terms of the, the Windrush generation and how they've been treated by, by the UK state through its home office function, which is a little short of disgraceful, but I think we need to be clear it's a logical symptom, a logical product of the UK government's hostile environment policy. And the reason I say that is that this committee has, in terms of Mary's question, has a real responsibility, therefore, to adopt a relentlessly critical perspective. Uh, therefore, to immediately get to power imbalances within society, therefore, to prioritise the widest range of, of, of voices that it can, but particularly people who do have lived experience of, of issues. And, to be, and, and I think, as Helen alluded to earlier, I think the committee does comparatively have quite a good track record in that. But of course, one of the, the worst things one can do for a human rights perspective is to be complacent. So it needs to make sure that it, that it, that it doesn't do that. I want just to focus on the asylum system uh, as an illustration of some of the challenges that, that we're working with. We are clear at Scottish Refugee Council, and I think we speak for the wider uh, refugee migrant sector in this, that there's been a real contortion of the universal human right to seek sanctuary and safety. Asylum within another country, which is bill articulated correctly, was a legal right that was born from the international community's revulsion at the horrors of the Holocaust. But we are clear that successive UK state governments, as a state part of the Refugee Convention, have contorted that right to asylum, have made it into something which it is not, made it into something which has got such, such negativity around it, when actually what it is is something that we genuinely should be proud of, and the people that are working making decisions, amongst other things, in asylum cases should be proud of. But we've, we've reached a point with the hostile environment currently, which, if anybody looks at the UK asylum system, the UK asylum system since 2000 has been the hostile environment policy in practice, but now it's been given that name uh, to a much wider group of individuals and people with other forms of immigration status uh, queries. So again, going back to the, 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 in terms of how one can, can and this is why I want to get to Gail's question earlier on, how one can make a practical difference to that. It is this relentlessly, criti relentlessly critical perspective. It is this emphasis on prevention and not putting perverse onus in the individuals. Um, but it's also about recognising that there's, there's really practical measures which, which need to be taken. So there's things like advocacy services, which are absolutely essential. We, we find that you know, if we didn't have advocacy services across people in the protection spectrum, we would not be able to, to get people to access their rights uh, at all. And if we don't have those advocacy services, then one of the things that that means is there's a decision which won't be articulated as such, but there's a decision getting made or that, you know, that people, it doesn't matter enough for people to get access to those advocacy services, precisely because advocacy services are a bridge in order for people to, to access rights. So it's very important that we're clear about they're not an additional add-on, they're an essential part for a human rights-based approach in, in any community where there's, where there always is significant power imbalances which affect certain groups uh, and communities, as, as Bill alluded to, and we need to work from, from that basis. So I think it's just to conclude to say that, you know, we really welcome that the inquiries work in doing this, the, inquiry, the, 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 the committee's got a proven track record in taking, in taking this work forward. The final thing I just wanted to mention is that you know we're moving into a Brexit environment now. We're very much in that environment. Uh, I'm, uh, for Scottish Refugee Council, we're very concerned about that environment because that removes the, 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 the sources, the European Union Directive sources of protection for people. 
who are on the international protection spectrum. Frankly, we do not trust the UK governments of successive generations in terms of how they have treated the rights of people in the asylum process. For example, the asylum support system, if, aside from the denial of the right to work, the asylum support system says it's OK for people to live on financial support between 40 and 50 per cent of the social security minimum that everybody else. Now, what is that if that's not discriminatory, if that's not state discrimination? People don't need to agree with that, but we're clear and we, we see that the, the lived experience for children who have to go without and don't get the food, for, for mums that have to go without and don't get the food and nutrition that they need. Uh, now, obviously, when Bill was talking earlier about you know, what's happened in terms of austerity, we've experienced that in the asylum support system for over 20 years now. And it's something that we need to name as a discriminatory system. Uh, some would say a racially discriminatory system. We would not disagree with that because we need to think about let's break the institutionalised thinking that we have around so many of our human rights, as, as Helen alluded to earlier on in the asylum support system, we think very clearly is one example of that. Why is it OK that a child that's came from Syria or Eritrea or Afghanistan won't, has to go without when a child who they're friends with at school doesn't get that? Of course, it's a disgrace and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case. And to give the Scottish Government their due, they recognise that and have tried to maximise measures to try and deal with that. So the Child Poverty Scotland Act is the, is the latest example of that in the National Delivery Plan. That's, that's come out come out from that. So we just need to be really clear, I think, of it as a as a Scottish Parliament that, that, that its committee structure is a really, really positive and it's I think essential intervention to make sure that human rights are, are taken forward and uh, you know and actually realisable for the people that are that are out, that are resident and citizens within 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 the country. Thanks very much, Graham. Very comprehensive um, uh, all, all round there. Michael, I've got a Time for a quick comment from you, and I'm afraid that we're going to have to uh, stop at the end of that. I know David's desperate to get in on the Brexit question, but Michael... If... To, to, to David's Brexit question. Go, go for it, David, quickly. Thank you, Convener. <laughs> um, as Brexit is fast approaching, less than a year away, um, do the panel members think that human rights will keep pace with Europe or is there a chance they'll be diluted? And the reason I'm asking this, I'm thinking about workers' rights and disabled rights, but also the third sector, where a lot of these organisations promote human rights but are funded directly from Europe. Gordon and then Michael. And we're incredibly concerned about where the protections for human rights will sit after, after Brexit. Um, and I think others will be able to talk specifically around some of those individual rights, but one thing I would say to this committee is to look at how you can maintain links with other European bodies after Brexit, including you know, the, the you know, there will still be bodies that UK is part of. Um, and I would implore on that because, despite everything, the UK has actually been a very positive force in human rights at a European level. I and mean, you look at what's been going on in Hungary uh, in, in, in recent years, the Humanist Society is going to be a part of an international movement uh, around, uh, around humanism, um, but also in, in areas like Poland and the right, the right to body integrity for women, uh, where we have seen concerted efforts uh, and actually trying to twist human rights language to try and limit uh, the rights of people in these, in these nations. It's been the European super, you know, supranational structure um, and, and, and backstop that has, that has protected against that. Um, so I think it remains to be seen what will happen. I think uh, we have to be sceptical about the, about the appetite for uh, UK governments to maintain the the pace of human rights development uh, based on some of the, the rhetoric of recent, recent years. Um, but what I would hope is that the Scottish Parliament doesn't, doesn't sort of vacate the space and you can find ways to, to keep those connections uh, and be a positive force, not just for human rights here, but for human rights across Europe and beyond. Yeah, I sit in the Current Affairs Commi Committee of the Council of Europe and I have no intention of vacating that position until they make me. <laughs> so, uh, Michael. Uh, well, I... I happened to have been uh, dealing with the EU WB yesterday, the European Union Withdrawal Bill uh, in London, and uh, I got the seven o'clock flight this morning to be here for this meeting. Um, so this is a topic which I have a great deal of interest in. Um, uh, we have promoted amendments at, in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords to retain the Charter for Fundamental Rights. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we're quite, uh, quite open that that would be the best way for those rights to be maintained and respected. 
uh, and we've encouraged the UK government so far not to uh, a great extent to amend uh, uh, the, the bill, but uh, we will persist with that until uh, the, the bill is concluded. Um, I think it's important also to remember that the bill itself contains provisions which would allow for the retention of fundamental rights and freedoms uh, which exist irrespective of the Charter. Uh, so it, it's not as if the whole structure of EU law relating to fundamental rights and freedoms is being dismantled in its entirety. And I think we've got to inject a, 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 a level of perspective into this, uh, which uh, recognises what the bill does do, as well as what the bill does not do. But there is no doubt that the removal of the Charter from uh, uh, our law uh, will uh, result in uh, an overall diminution of the mechanisms for recognition of rights. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we've, we've got to maintain, uh, as we go forward into the, uh, into the, the uh, transition and implementation period, and then uh, in terms of all the other um, uh, arrangements which we're going to have with the European Union uh, in the future, such as the security treaty, um, uh, or uh, the ongoing partnership uh, agreements, that these things are maintained. I suspect that we, we ought to be thinking about how this Parliament looks at those future relationships, not only with the, with the EU, but also with the trading partners that we're going to have across the world. Because, of course, trade deals can have impacts on human rights. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, the UN principles of, uh, on business and human rights uh, have to be uh, acknowledged. We've got to be thinking about the application of those principles to those trade arrangements. Uh, and uh, I've exceeded my time, convener. Thank you. <laughs> Lucy's like, can I get out of this? I'm not sure. <laughs> Helen, uh, if you can be really, really quick. We've got some business that we need to conclude by 11.30 in private. So we're, we're really pushing up against a way past our time scale. <laughs> it's so interesting okay. that we're finding, we're finding it difficult we stop. So. Um, OK, so I'll make the points just in bullet point form. Um, I think the, the first thing that we would say is that we're for, for workers' rights in particular, we're concerned about the loss of the court. So um, the ECJ played a really important role in, in upholding those upholding those rights. And I think um, it's one it's the loss of even that expansionist jurisprudence that the that the ECJ takes is one that we're quite concerned about. We're concerned about the direction of travel of the UK government because we saw them kind of on picking workers' rights that weren't nailed down by Europe um, over the last few years. So, for example, the fact that unfair dismissal is now can't be challenged until after two years, you know, that extension of that time period from one year to two years, um, the reduce of consultation rights, different things that, that they could undo, they did undo, and we're concerned about that kind of um, bonfire of regulation stuff that you, you hear from the UK government and what that means for workers' rights in the long term. I think um, we accept in the short term that hopefully there'll be a transposition of rights as, as they stand at the minute. Um, we're also concerned about what happens with trade deals and the issue of private justice for um, private companies uh, within that and um, that obviously can happen within the European framework but we think that it's augmented when you um, when we are now a small nation state concluding trade deals with big com with big countries we're concerned about what what is the requirements that the USA would, would require of us, for example, and would that um, take away our environmental rights? Could it take away our workers' rights through proxy, through trade deals agreed in secret with um, these sort of state resolution uh, mechanisms within them that mean that you then don't even have the normal rule of law that you can rely on? So I think the question for us around trade is very, very big, but in short, yes, we're quite concerned about what happens to workers' rights after Brexit. Thanks very much, Helen. We have really ran, ran out of time now because we do have a very important piece of work that we have to agree in uh, in private when we're finished. Um, can, I, can I say thank you to you all this morning? This inquiry is ongoing for a, 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 a number of weeks um, and we're really keen to hear from all of you. So if you go away and you had a position on Brexit or on anything else that you felt that you, 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 know, you couldn't articulate this morning, please let us know because we're really keen to hear everybody's perspective in all of these areas. Um, so if you go away and you think I'm going to send a wee page or a half a page or whatever it is you think we need to know, 
know, please do that. I'd urge you to do that, and we would be very uh, grateful to receive it too. But thank you so much for all of your oral evidence this morning, your written evidence, and your work with us ongoing on this inquiry. I'm going to suspend now to get into private uh, for us to continue our piece of work that we need to do quickly. <laughs>